opening the door wide to new possibilities, hope of real breakthroughs and understanding more big ideas than we could have ever These imagined. These are the biggest grants we've ever been able to We are going to come out of this with some breakthrough ideas. Focused solely on your end of You are not alone. We are all with you on the was scheduled on here to be Dr. Uh, Stephen Labuti, uh, who unfortunately couldn't make it today, but his right-hand person who recently joined our group at uh, Montefiore Einstein Center for Cancer Care, Dr. John McAuliffe, Dr. McAuliffe, excuse me, Dr. John McAuliffe, who recently came here from Memorial Sloan Kettering and is an expert in pancreatic and uh, liver surgery, is going to be speaking to us about surgical aspects and management of liver metastases. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you all. Thank you, Dr. Hollander and Dr. Wolin. Um, like Dr. Wolin said, um, I'm new here to uh, the disease, an infant in the disease around giants here. Um, first started, born and raised in the Houston area, went to MD Anderson for an MD PhD. Then went to the University of Alabama, uh, Birmingham for surgery, surgery training, and they came up to Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, which was a huge move for me and my family, um, and learned about neuroendocrine tumor by uh, Dr. Diane Reedy, who we'll hear about uh, her, what she's doing here shortly, and uh, hopefully learned a few things from her. So I'd like to talk to you about a massive topic. This is, you know, Phil's textbooks and multiple chapters, and a lot of literature out there about surgical options for neuroendocrine tumors, and specifically liver-directed therapies. <clears throat> and I know you've, some of you may be overwhelmed with all the information you've received at this point, but I just want to summarize this quickly, the nature of the problem is with some statistics. Seven out of ten neuroendocrine tumors that are diagnosed arise in the GI tract, and up to half of those patients get liver metastasis, whether it is at the time of diagnosis or within the process of the disease, most of which have a primary tumor within the small bowel, colon, or pancreas. Up to two-thirds of patients have symptoms at the time of diagnosis or during the process of the disease, which could include bowel obstruction, pain, carcinoid syndrome, which we've heard about, which could ultimately lead to heart disease. And I like to just, uh, you know, I use lots of pictures because I'm a dumb surgeon, but it uh, illustrates um, s kind of what's going on in the body of somebody who's having symptoms. For instance, a patient might, be, might present with a tumor within their right side of their colon at the connection of their small bowel, which is the ileocecal valve. This patient might, this tumor might, you know, cause a lot of irritation in the area that causes all these nondescript GI symptoms, including bowel obstruction. So the patient might have nausea, vomiting, et cetera, so forth. Additionally, this tumor can excrete hormones, which typically, at least in the primary setting or a small tumor in the bowel, travels through the portal system and goes to the liver. The liver is very good at metabolizing these hormones, and patients don't really have those carcinoid-type symptoms. However, sometimes patients, unfortunately, get metastasis that principally go to the liver. And these uh, tumors grow, can cause pain as the liver capsule expands, but also the liver is unable to metabolize these hormones, and these hormones are dumped into the whole body circulation and go all over the body, causing those symptoms we've heard about, such as diarrhea, flushing, heart disease, etc. <clears throat> During the evaluation of patients, at the forefront and a critical aspect of that evaluation of surgical patients is cross-sectional imaging namely CAT scans, MRIs, as well as what we've heard about these nuclear medicine studies called Gallium-68, which is the most advanced and accurate test. A patient I saw recently uh, presented with intermittent bowel obstruction, additionally had some pain, and at an outside hospital had a CAT scan performed, which is evident in these yellow arrows, um, shows a tumor at that colon uh, small bowel junction. Additionally, unfortunately, the patient presented also with what was concerning for a metastasis in the liver, as you can see in the middle panel at the top. A repeat imaging was performed with an MRI that better defined that lesion and did confirm that this was a metastasis. Part of the evaluation in our multidisciplinary uh, tumor board with Dr. Wolin and others, including Steve Labuti, we performed a, a nuclear medicine gallium uh, scan, as we've heard about which confirmed that these two areas were in fact uh, somatostatin receptor positive and the extent of the patient's uh, burden of disease. So both of these areas were removable and he'll be coming to the operating, soon, operating room soon um, for his treatment. 
<clears throat> in the primary setting, the surgeon plays a critical role in the potentially curative intent of the disease process. I've illustrated a couple pictures here of what the surgeon does in the operating room while you're asleep. For instance, in a patient that has a, right, a left-sided colon, can, uh, colon uh, tumor or neuroendocrine tumor, the surgeon removes that part of the colon along with adjacent normal tissue as well as the lymph node basin and then reconstructs the colon to recapitulate normal anatomy and normal function. Likewise, if a patient has a tumor in the, uh, the, the um, downstream part of their stomach, that part of the stomach is removed with the lymph nodes and reconstructed as in the lower panel on the left. Additionally, if a patient has a pancreas tumor, particularly in the tail, that part of the pancreas can be removed um, to cure the disease, but also to allow the remaining pancreas to keep up with the normal bodily functions, and patients do very well. The same thing can be said about the adrenal glands. An adrenal can be removed, and the other adrenal will keep up with the normal bodily functions without any untoward effects. <clears throat> The principal uh, site of metastasis for neuroendocrine tumors, as I've said before, is the liver. And the liver is important in metabolism, as well as filtering toxins, as I've talked about before, as well as um, draining bile and blood products that are critical in the digestion process. As you can see, a tumor can uh, present in the liver, but not only the, the number of tumors, but also the location of the tumors. Okay, and a liver surgeon is required to define if these uh, these tumors can be removed or treated safely while maintaining the remaining part of the liver that's critical in the functions of life. Unfortunately, up to this point, there are not a lot of level one or high quality data to direct the treatment team in what's the best first therapy, the second best therapy, and how they all get combined together. So what emerges is a multidisciplinary discussion between each member of the treatment team as well as the patient and what their expectations are, as well as the tumor biology. We've heard about grade one, two, and three tumors, these low grade, well differentiated versus the high grade, poorly differentiated tumors. So the remainder of this talk, I'd like to talk about surgery, embolization, which is essentially just throwing a dam in the artery that is feeding this tumor. Ablation, isolated liver perfusion, as well as liver transplantation. And again, how these all work together with the biologics we've heard about, as well as the chemotherapeutics, is still an emerging field and still an exciting part of the field. So first of all, talking about surgery itself. Up to about the last couple decades, liver surgery has been riddled with disaster. Lots of blood loss, lots of poor outcomes, because the liver is a, um, a complicated organ and a lot of bleeding can be um, encountered. That being said, over the last couple decades and, and really um, championed by Memorial Sloan Kettering is um, improved anesthesia techniques as well as surgical techniques. So now liver surgery, which can be performed at multiple institutions throughout the United States as well as the world, is safe and relatively low risk. Up to 20 to 30 percent of patients that have metastasis to their liver and neuroendocrine tumor are able to have their tumors removed or are resectable. The liver has eight different uh, segments, uh, numbered one through eight. The liver has uh, a few blood vessels that go into it and a, and a large uh, couple vessels that, uh, that drain the liver. Additionally, there's bile ducts, as I, as I had talked about, as well as the gallbladder. Some patients, depending on the location and the number of the tumor, need to undergo a, ma a major hepatectomy, which is removing three or more segments of the liver. Or some patients, depending again on the location and the number, can have a segmental resection, which is removing one or two segments of the liver, as illustrated in the right upper panel, where a patient had a neuroendocrine tumor near the left hepatic vein, which required removal of segment two and three, as you can see in this uh, image, leaving the rest of the liver, which is a huge amount of liver, able to um, continue um, the functions of life. Another modality used in the surgery, uh, particularly with peripheral lesions or lesions that are outside uh, the outside areas of the liver, is enucleation, or essentially shelling out these tumors, as you can see here in the right lower panel. During a surgical intervention, it's important, too, to also remove the gallbladder, or what's called a cholecystectomy, to prevent any um, long-term potential complications related to gallbladder disease or gallstone disease. An alternative method of liver-directed therapy is called ablation, which is essentially cooking the tumors. This uh, modality is used 
for tumors that are not able to be removed or in combination with tumors that can be removed and typically used for tumors that are less than five centimeters in, um, in diameter. There are two different types of ablations. There's uh, thermal and electroporation, which I'll talk about here in a moment. <clears throat> Radiofrequency ablation, microwave ablation, the principal types of thermal ablations where high frequency waves are delivered directly to the tumor and cook the tumor or destroy it, what's called coagulation necrosis. Either, in, you, uh, either with an interventional radiologist or with a surgeon in the radiology suite or in the operating room, ultrasound um, technology can be used to find the tumors and guide catheters into the tumor as illustrated in the, in the left-hand part of the slide. And um, high-frequency waves can be delivered directly to the tumors and cook them. Most uh, patients um, find this a very well-tolerated procedure with release of, relief of symptoms in about 95% of those people, and three-quarters of patients also have improvements in their tumor markers. That being said, this technology is limited to tumors that are away from major blood vessels as well as the major bile ducts. An alternative therapy that overcomes those limitations is called uh, irreversible electroporation, otherwise known as nanonife. This technology uses electricity to electrocute and punch holes in the tumor cell's membranes. What happens after electrocution is these tumor cells undergo programmed cell death, and the immune system comes up and eats these tumors over time. You're able to, um, literature suggests and evidence uh, shows that um, you're able to use this technology next to major blood vessels and bile ducts without injury to those. You can see here in this panel, this is, whoops, sorry. Um, this is the machine that is either in the interventional suite or in the operating room which are plugged into wires here that go to these uh, catheters, which are uh, bracket the tumor under ultrasound guidance and then electrocute them. An alternative um, strategy for those tumors that um, cannot uh, be removed surgically or ablated is embolization. Again, this is throwing a dam in the, in the blood flow leading to these tumors. And the rationale for this is the neuroendocrine tumors have a robust arterial blood flow that can be accessed in the interventional suite or in the operating room through the groin using the femoral artery and hepatic artery. This uh, type of modality is typically used for low or intermediate grade neuroendocrine tumors and um, three different types of embolization are principally used, either bland, which is just the damming up the river going to the uh, tumors, or um, chemotherapy that is attached to these beads. Additionally, uh, radioembolization can be performed particularly Y90 or yttrium-90. The response rates are quite good, depending on the, what you're looking at in the literature, between 30 and 95% uh, response rates and durable survivals. An alternative, mo much more aggressive therapy um, for liver tumors um, are I is isolated liver perfusion. This modality is used for unresectable liver metastasis despite all other therapies. The rationale for this is that the the liver can be isolated from the rest of the whole body circulation, and high doses of heated chemotherapy can give it directly to the liver without having the systemic toxicities um, typical at those doses. This is a large procedure that takes about nine hours on average in the operating room, with a length of stay of about approximately 10 days following the procedure, and up to 60% of patients have some sort of complication following this procedure. That being said, in well-selected patients, 50, there's a 50% response rate. The way the procedure is performed is um, illustrated here in this slide, where the blood vessels and bile duct that flow in and out of the liver are dissected out and isolated, as well as the vena cava, which is above the liver, draining into the heart. A patient is put on a veno-veno bypass, which is a perfusion machine similar to a heart, um, a heart surgery, and catheters are placed. Oops. Sorry again. In, this, uh, in the blood vessels where heated chemotherapy is delivered directly to the liver and then drained out through the cava. As you can imagine, this is a production. There is a lot of people involved in the operating room making sure that everything's done safely and effectively, and there's lots of machines that help us do that. But again, as I've said, this works out for a selected group of folks. <clears throat> An alternative therapy, again, another aggressive liver-directed therapy is liver transplantation, where the diseased liver or the, the liver that has the um, liver tumors in them 
is taken out completely and a part of a liver or a complete liver from another person is put into that person with cancer. This is used for lower intermediate grade neuroendocrine tumors that have proven that their disease is confined to the liver only. Patients who undergo this procedure um, require lifelong immunosuppression following the procedure. In highly selected patients, literature suggests that the survival is quite good. Disease-free survival is about 30% at five years, which is good in these patients who have very aggressive disease that is um, refractory to other types of therapy. So how do we put all this together? That um, question was partially answered in a retrospective fashion um, by our colleagues over at um, Hopkins, who looked at um, eight different hepatobiliary centers here in the United States, as well as Switzerland and Italy. We looked at 339 patients from 1985 to 2009. And you can see here in the graph, or the chart, to the, um, to the right, this is a mixed bag of patients with multiple different types of tumors. Uh, uh, many of these patients had symptoms and metastasis at the time of diagnosis. And each of these patients had surgery or other liver-directed therapies. And Overall, as you can see in this chart, survival plotted on the x-axis and uh, patients surviving over the, uh, y on the y-axis show that after liver-directed therapy, 10, um, survival was about 10 years. So these are patients who have metastatic disease and half of them are surviving over 10 years, which is absolutely fantastic. An important silver lining here is that Dr. Wool, you know, as we've heard from Dr. Wool and others, there's a lot of emerging uh, therapies for this disease which are not included in this study. So how these new therapies and liver-directed therapies work together is research currently underway, and I look forward to hearing Dr. Uh, Reedy's comments shortly. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>